Okay, folks, let's get started. A lot of last minute questions about this figure. Okay, so uh, the figure is showing you, all right, this is what I showed at the end of the last period. This figure is showing you the uh, relative places where these individual opsins are absorbing. And as the young man pointed out to me here earlier, red isn't, this isn't really the ideal place to get red. Red is actually further out here. However, if we look at the absorption spectrum, okay, we have uh, the, that oh, wrong one, uh, cone pig, here we go. Okay, so this guy is able to get things further out here, and so it's going to be more sensitive to longer wavelengths than this guy is here. It's not perfect. Is there overlap? Yes, there's overlap. Okay. Uh, do we have a perfect system for absorption? We don't. We can chemically go out and make a color TV that has perfect ways of putting these out, but our eyes don't have perfect ways of seeing those. Our brain does sort that out. And so as I will show you today, uh, the red and green receptors are very closely related to each other, and it's that close relationship that ultimately results in color blindness for some people. It's not this absorption difference, though. That's not what's happening with color blindness. All right? So even though you see this guy over here just about 30 nanometers um, in wavelength higher for an optimum, it's, you still get that distinction. Obviously, if you didn't, you wouldn't be seeing red. OK. Now, um, let's go back here. So as I pointed out last time, these, when we look in different organisms, we see uh, somewhat different uh, receptors, and we see different differences in the evolutionary relationships. If we look at rhodopsin, look at rhodopsin, 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 rhodopsin. All right? But we see different color receptors that have evolved from them in different ways along the evolutionary trail rather differently. We see chickens have a very wide range with which they see stuff. They see things down here uh, and up here. Mouse um, has a very odd one way down here in the blue. Okay? Blue or violet, you call it what you want to at this point. Uh, and chickens, as I said, uh, have an ability to see somewhat in the infrared. So they see what we would think of as heat uh, a little bit more than we do. We don't, we don't see that uh, as such. Okay. Well, the red and the green in human beings, as you see here, they're evolutionarily not very far apart. And we measure evolutionary distance by sequence of proteins, which means that the sequence of the uh, proteins in the red and green opsins uh, that we have are very similar in sequence. And that actually itself is the way that color blindness arises. So it turns out that the, red, the genes for the red and the green opsins are on the X chromosome. Okay? So it means we have, uh, if we're guys, we have one good set of copies. Women have two good sets of copies. Okay? Well, if I'm a guy and I have something that happens to one of my sets of copies, I can have some issues. And one of the most common things that happens to one of my sets of copies is recombination. Now, if you remember when I talked back about recombination, I talked about the fact that we have homologous recombination as the most common type of recombination. And this is a recombination that occurs between related sequences. So when we have two sequences that are very closely related, such as these guys are, it's not uh, unreasonable to think that they might, uh, during uh, the, the, the time when recombination can occur, they might cross over with respect to each other. If we see a scenario happening like we see on the top, then an individual who suffered recombination uh, across their opsin genes, and if they're a male, they may end up with only one copy. They, they don't have a green receptor. They may only have a red receptor. It may go the other way. They may only have a green and not have uh, a red receptor. The important point being that they don't have three receptors. They have two. So it turns out that color blindness, A, is most common in males not surprisingly. And the most common type of color blindness is red-green. And again, it arises from this likelihood of recombination uh, that happens. So that's why color blindness happens, or one of the ways color blindness happens, and it's uh, why we see it uh, more predominantly in males than we see it in females. Clear as mud? Connie? Well, developmentally, recombination can happen in a cell at any time. But if this happens in a developing embryo or in gametes that lead to a developing embryo, then all the cells of the embryo is going to have that. So you're not going to wake up one day and be colorblind unless you magically destroyed all of your receptors of a certain type. No. 
And that's not going to happen by this mechanism. You would have had to, let's say, you had a, I don't know, a weird situation, a chemical that only affected green ones, for example. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about waking up colorblind. Yes? What happens to people who are, um, I guess you could call color deficient, where they see the colors, but sometimes they have a hard time functioning in different shades of the same color? So what she is asking about is, are people color deficient? What's the difference with that? Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I would say that is really a manifestation of the same thing. Okay. All this is processing uh, in terms of signals the brain gets. So if the brain's not getting the signal, it can't distinguish between the two. Uh, short of that, uh, somebody else asked me about kinesthesia earlier. Where kinesthesia is where you uh, have connections that uh, largely uh, mix up the signals of, let's say, color with numbers, for example or colors in music. Some people say that they, they have crosses with those. And this isn't happening at the level of, the, of, the, of the, the neurons. This is happening in the brain, OK? So that there's changes in the way that those signals are being processed. And they're, being, they're crossing at some section of the brain. So it has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. OK, good questions. I really like the fact you guys had a bunch of questions on this. It's kind of cool stuff. So uh, senses are pretty awesome. Well, the last two senses that I have to talk about, um, I won't say um, as much about, um, and, uh, but they're nonetheless cool and interesting. One of them is hearing, and uh, hearing arises as a result of manipulation. And when I say manipulation, I'm talking about mechanical changes, that is physical movement changes, that are happening to hair cells inside of your ear. And you see these little cones of... Um, of um, or cone-like structures that are at the top. These are actually the, the structures that are being moved during the mechanical um, agitation that happens with sound waves. So a sound wave, this is now that, that sort of pyramidal thing that's on top. The nerve ending is right here. All these are nerve endings relating to uh, um, um, sound. And what happens is sound is, the, is one of the senses that is, as I said, mechanical, touch being another one. But sound happens because of sound waves that are being propagated. And sound waves can physically move things. And that's what's happening with these very, very delicate uh, ear cells that are the, these cells in your ear, hair cells that are in your ear. And what happens um, is, I'm going to show you a better figure here, is right here. Okay? This is a close-up of those individual cells that were in that bundle that you saw in that pyramid. And if you look very carefully, you see that the bundle of one hair cell is physically attached to the one adjacent to it. There's a similar one right here that you can see. And that attachment is real. And so what happens when a sound wave hits this bundle of hair cells is that the bundle gets slightly displaced. This is schematically shown here. So here's two of the cells that are in that bundle. We see a sound wave come along, and it physically moves it. All right. So we see this movement. Since we have an attachment that's there, it's shown as a little spring, the attachment is able to physically open, okay, open up this um, uh, nerve cell. And in this, into this nerve cell, ions can flow as a result. All right? So let's go back to that figure. All right? So we see um, right here. All right? So here's that opening. All right? And mechanical, mechanical movement happens. This guy slides very slightly as a result of a sound wave coming. This opens up an opening, and it's no different than when we opened up an opening to let sodium ions in or potassium ions in and nerve signaling. This and these are, yes, in fluid. These guys are then uh, allowing in sodium ions, and that starts a signal that says, hey, I heard something, or hey, I got hit by a sound wave. What's remarkable is that our brain, again, puts all those together, and we perceive those as coherent sounds. We can not only perceive them as coherent sounds, but we can also tell direction. And the reason we can tell direction is our brain can sort out which ear got the most information. And as a consequence of that, go, oh, that happened over there. But that happened in front of me. That happened behind me. It's remarkable the uh, directions that we can perceive uh, with sound. OK. Questions about that? OK. The last sense I'll talk about is touch. I alluded to it earlier. And uh, touch uh, is the least understood sense. It, uh, we, we study touch uh, mostly from the sense of pain uh, receptors. 
but there are many components of touch. There's a mechanical component to touch. There's a temperature component to touch. There are chemical components to touch. All right? And we can sense all of these things with our sense of touch. The work, most work that's been done, as I said, is with pain receptors. Um, one of the students in the class at the end of the last period sent me a, a very neat link. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for that. Uh, for uh, talking about how capsaicin receptors that are in our tongue um, were there uh, evolutionarily for the purpose of protecting our tongue against very hot substances. Okay, so they were there on our tongue as a pain receptor. So if we had something very hot, they uh, evolved on our tongue at least from that sense. Capsaicin is the compound that on our tongue or on our um, uh, 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 membranes of our, uh, I shouldn't say membranes, uh, the, the sort of fluid membranes of our cell, like the, our sinuses or something like that. Capsaicin is a compound that will actually activate those pain receptors. So capsaicin is the compound that's found inside of uh, habanero peppers, hot peppers and so forth. And what it's doing is it's activating those pain receptors by opening them up and allowing calcium to move into them. So calcium is actually the ion that's moving with these receptors. And the calcium signal that's going in uh, through this uh, receptor tells the brain, OK, I'm, I've got something going on. And the brain senses this as, uh, in the case of, of a hot food, as a, a pain-like uh, substance. Okay. Now, um, it's kind of neat, when we, and I love evolutionary analyses, it's, it's kind of neat looking at the evolution of this receptor uh, that's out there. So human beings have this receptor, okay? Dogs, cats have this receptor, okay? Uh, if you give an animal a hot food, uh, you know, a, a spicy hot food that has capsaicin in it from hot peppers or something, they're going to feel very much like what you feel, okay? But interestingly, birds don't have it, right? And the reason it appears that birds don't have it is that the plants that carry capsaicin evolved capsaicin so that it wouldn't affect the birds because the birds distribute the seeds. And so the birds, you know, if the birds were affected by this, they go to a habanero plant, for example, and they grab the seeds and they eat the seeds. And for many plants, the way that seeds get distributed is the bird eats them, it passes through the digestive system, then they poop it out somewhere, and the, uh, the plant grows as a result. Birds don't have those receptors. Uh, so a very cool uh, piece of um, ev uh, evolutionary uh, interest there, I think. Okay, capsaicin is actually used. Uh, the receptor is not a 7TM, by the way. The receptor is actually shown here. It has a pore, and that pore can uh, open, as I said, and allow calcium ions uh, to flow into it. Um, capsaicin will cause the pore to open. And there are other things that probably will also cause that pore to open. The next figure shows um, the effect of heat and uh, pH. Okay? So as we alter the pH, we can, uh, in fact, activate those receptors that are there. We see the same thing happening with temperature. And that's not totally surprising because, again, when we think of the effect of temperature and pH on protein structure, this is a membrane protein. If it gets exposed to either of these things, we're going to see some slight changes in structure. And those slight changes in structure are going to allow ions to flow, in this case, and give that signal. Hey, I'm hot. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, giving a, I, I'm, I'm telling you to, to be careful here. Okay. Questions about this? Yeah. Uh, I have a question, actually, back on the hearing part. Uh-huh. Is the temporary hearing loss you get from loud noises a function of those little threads being snapped or damaged? Yeah, so is the, is the temporary hearing loss you get from hearing a loud noise a result of damage to those hair cells? Probably to some extent, I would say, and again, not an expert, I would say probably yes. Okay? Uh, there was a very interesting study that was reported in the past 10 days about hearing that uh, may relate to this. And this interesting study uh, re relates to actually a structure that they have found in hair cells that they didn't know was there. And it's a structure that allows a hair cell to basically um, uh, sort of become stiffer. And they think that what it's doing is it is um, that if you stimulate something for a long time with a, with a signal, okay? So the example I give in class is 
you, spell, you, you, you spill a very smelly chemical in the lab. Okay? At first, it stinks like crazy. After you work around it for a while, you don't notice it, but people walking in notice it. And so what's happening is that signaling is, is, is stopping. The brain is also stopping paying attention to it. It appears that the hair cell has this stiffening mechanism after it's been stimulated for a long time to sort of resist that. And so that may play a role in this process. It's very newly discovered. Like I said, it's, it's come up in the past 10 days. That's how, how, how recent it is. So it may relate to what you said. Okay. Well, we've got a lot to cover in the rest of the period today, so we want to make sure we don't skip any of that. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you guys to make sure that you um, read through everything that I don't get through, and then we'll have that on the uh, final. So, uh, the um, nobody protested that. This is the easiest group I have ever taught. <laughs> now you're smiling. How do you know that I've changed my mind? I just said, read through it, and you're responsible for whatever I don't get through here. Laura? Just, whoosh, that's what happened to my hair. Whoosh, many years ago. Whoosh. Some student came by, and I said that, and they scalped me, and that's what happened to my <laughs> It's funny for you. <laughs> the immune system, okay? The immune system is, um, I think, in comparison to the senses, equally magical and equally mysterious. And the immune system is something that when scientists first started studying it, there were some enormous, enormous technical considerations. How in the world can the immune system function, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you what one of those is, okay? Our immune system can make 10 to the 12th different antibodies. One trillion different antibodies. Now, when people first came to grips with that, back in the 80s, they said, how in the world can a genome that only has a few billion base pairs code for over a trillion different antibodies. That means you're getting a thousand antibodies for every base pair of the genome. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And so there was this element of, wow, there's just, how can that possibly be? Well, we know today mechanisms whereby the immune system can actually make that number of antibodies. And I'm going to tell you, you already know those. Right? You've seen them by mixing and matching of exons. Okay? When we mix and match exons, what we see is an ability to create combinations that we didn't otherwise have the ability to do. Okay? Let's take a quick look at that. Okay? Here is a coding sequence for an antibody we see that the coding sequence has various regions that I'll actually come back and talk about in just a little bit. But it has these various coding regions. Some of them end up in an antibody. Some of them don't. And the more mixing and matching that a cell can do with respect to these regions, the more possible antibodies that a cell can make. So the answer is, yes, a cell, the body, can make 10 to the 12 antibodies. But it does it by mixing and matching things. Okay. Mixing and matching through splicing is one mechanism. Mixing and matching through recombination is another mechanism. And there's a third mechanism that's kind of interesting. It's a mechanism that results in generation of mutations. Immune cells have a DNA polymerase that they will invoke that isn't very good at copying at certain points during their, during their development, which means that they're, they make mistakes as they're going along. And those mistakes in these antibody coding regions actually help to increase the diversity of these segments as well. That's absolutely incredible. Okay? The result is that cells really can make, or a body can make, 10 to the 12th different antibodies. Yes, sir? Without computer-aided technology, how did early researchers even determine if that would be at the limit? 
Without computer-aided technology, how they determine the upper limit, um, I can't answer that question, but they certainly can tell that they have a diversity of antibodies that it, with, within a given organism. And they can see how that would change over time, and my uh, expectation is that they just simply extrapolate it, but I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. The antibodies that you're making today, okay, may not be the same as the antibodies you're making tomorrow. Your immune system is, is continually evolving antibodies as we're going along. Anesia? Is that what contributes to autoimmune diseases? Yeah, so autoimmune diseases arise um, as a result. It's, it's kind of a complicated process. So let me just, since you've asked the question, very briefly answer that for you. Um, when we're an infant, our immune system is sort of evolving. Our immune system is starting to put together those cells that will make antibodies and protect us. The child that's nursing is getting antibodies from mom, and that's, that's helping in that process of protection while the infant's immune system is evolving. And part of that if evolution of that, the infant's immune system is selecting a way that is destroying cells that will bind to the body, to the proteins in that, that, that uh, infant's own system. Okay? Autoimmune diseases arise because cells that bind to proteins in the body's system start recognizing them and binding to them. So that it can result from a lack of selection that happens very early during infancy. It may happen as a result of some odd recombination that happens that wouldn't have otherwise happened that's generated those. But autoimmune, uh, autoimmunity happens because your own immune system is attacking you. Autoimmunity uh, comes about with lupus, okay? Um, I have psoriasis. I get various spots that, are, that appear. And that psoriasis is a product of an autoimmune response where um, the body is, is basically attacking itself. There's other, other examples of that as well. When we think about antibodies, uh, antibodies are the main uh, line of defense of the immune system. They're the primary way in which the, through which the immune system works. Um, that, that's not the one I wanted. Antibodies are structurally looking like this guy. Okay? They have a Y-shaped structure. They have a short chain. Okay? called a light chain. It's relatively short. It goes this two segments here. And we have something called a heavy chain. You can see this here. The heavy chain over here is the same as the heavy chain over here. The light chain over here is the same as the light chain over here. Okay. Starting from left to right, we go from amino carboxyl, uh, I'm sorry, amino to carboxyl. And starting over here, we go from amino down to carboxyl down here. You'll notice that the light chains are joined to the heavy chain by a green bond right there, and that green bond is a disulfide bond. And similarly, the two heavy chains are held together by a green bond that is also a disulfide bond. So the whole thing is held together by disulfide bonds. You also notice on this uh, structure that you see various regions called VL, VH. Well, H stands for heavy, so this is a variable, and V stands for variable, a variable region of the heavy chain VL stands for a variable region of the light chain. It's out in these variable regions that antibodies have specific structures that recognize and bind to other specific structures. Usually they're proteins, but they don't have to be. Okay? So the binding region of an antibody is out in the variable regions. And the places where one antibody will differ from another are primarily in these regions. What we see is that if we look in the constant regions, they're not absolutely constant. Okay? There are different classes of antibodies, and one class will have one type of constant region, another class will have another type. Okay? But all antibodies will vary considerably out in their variable region, as shown right here. Jody? And the C is indicated by the, yeah, the C stands for constant. I'm sorry, yeah. So that's constant light, constant heavy, constant heavy, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so that's structurally what uh, an antibody has. When we look at antibody diversity, as I mentioned uh, previously, what we see is that uh, the coding region for these in our chromosomes has little exons that get mixed and matched to make a functional antibody. Okay. You see, here's uh, a variable region okay, that you saw in that last schematic. And this is for a light chain. So this variable region has 40 different possible exons. Well, if you start thinking about the number of combinations, the number of ways you can put those guys together, 
Okay? It's an enormous number just for that alone. Now, we're not talking about heavy chains or anything else. We're talking about one segment of one antibody. The variable regions are spliced and recombined and mutated uh, to give a tremendous amount of diversity out here. And then that spliced product is spliced to different regions called joining regions. That's what the J stands for here. So the joining region that we had on that antibody a moment ago are this little segment right here, that little segment is the joining region. So we see a variable being joined to a joining region. And finally, we have a constant region that's out there. And uh, the ultimate product puts all those together to make that light chain. As we can see, we'll have a lot of variability out in the variable region. The, const the joining regions really don't mix and match much. And the constant region doesn't have anything to, mi to mix and match at all. Okay? If we look at the heavy chains, uh, by contrast, uh, the heavy chains uh, have a um, similar setup. They have more variable regions. Okay? So there's 51 right there. There's 27 more. And these are called D regions. Ds are the other portion of that variability that happens. There's some joining regions. And we see different constant regions out here. And the constant regions uh, will vary a bit according to antibody type. So there are five major classes of antibodies, and they will vary in the structure of their constant regions uh, partially. The five different regions of uh, five different classes of antibody you see on the screen here, they're known as IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE. IgE is, IgG is the most abundant class of antibodies that we have in our cells, and it's that nice Y-shaped structure that I showed you uh, previously. IgM is a, um, uh, a structurally somewhat different um, class of antibodies. It has a pentameric uh, structure, as you can see here. It is usually the first class of antibodies that is produced in response to an infection. Okay. First class produced in response to an infection. The IgA is commonly found in mucus uh, or uh, tears, very common there. Uh, people describe IgA as being a first line of defense because if we think about it, when we breathe things in, the mucus in our lungs uh, uh, is uh, going to have this class of antibodies in it, are the, are the tears of our eyes, uh, et cetera. Uh, IgD, the function isn't completely understood uh, what it does. And IgE uh, is, uh, plays a variety of roles. From a health perspective, one of the most important ones that we see is it actually gets stimulated in allergic responses. So if you have a very nasty allergic response, IgE is actually going crazy uh, with being synthesized there. So that's uh, an important consideration. OK. Um, let's see. We talk about the cells of the immune system that make antibodies. We have um, uh, two main classes of cells, the so-called B cells and the T cells. The T cells themselves get broken into two divisions as well, helper T cells and cytotoxic killer T cells. So the immune, they, they all can make uh, and do make antibodies. The, uh, what you see here is a B cell. And the B cell is, uh, has on its surface uh, an antibody, in this case an IgM. That antibody uh, is out there to uh, recognize and protect the uh, body. And B cells get activated by binding to an antigen. So your body's making a whole bunch of antibodies right now that aren't doing anything. And that pattern that it's making today is at least a little bit different from that pattern it was making yesterday. Immune cells in your immune system, uh, unless they're part of what's called immune memory, usually have a half-life of a couple of weeks. Okay? If they don't bind something in that couple of weeks, then they haven't, in fact, encountered any antigens that are there. The body says, well, I'm not going to make any more of this. Why waste my time? Let's make something else. There are memory cells of the immune system that, in fact, uh, are produced at a low level constantly, and that's what gives us immunity. When we give a vaccination and we give immunity, we're stimulating the production of these memory cells that are there. Those memory cells will, will be around. They argue for how long that is, but on average we say that 10 years is a reasonable time. If it's been 10 years since you've had a vaccination, um, or more than 10 years since you've had a vaccination, you may not have those memory cells around. When I was a kid, everybody got uh, vaccinated for polio, and... Um, 
uh, also for smallpox. And uh, I probably have no resistance to polio or smallpox because they didn't, they didn't give uh, boosters over a period of time. They do that for tetanus, for example, because tetanus is out there and going to get us. Polio kind of disappeared, smallpox kind of disappeared, and we got lazy and we didn't boost and, and uh, protect people as a result of that. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening in the immune response is this uh, particular antibody has, has recognized a structure on this antigen. An antigen is a structure bound by an antibody. It has a specific structure. And what's happening in this process is the binding of the antigen is actually stimulating a signaling process that's going on. The signaling process that's going on is, uh, in fact, uh, going through these uh, various domains here. We've seen once we get a signal inside in a signaling process that cells can respond to it appropriately. And in this case, what's going to happen is this cell is going to be stimulated to divide. So once I've got an immune, ce immune cell that's out there that is bound to an antibody, and I want to mount a defense against what might be an invading virus, the first thing I want this cell that has this antibody to do is start dividing. Because if it starts dividing, it's going to make a lot more antibodies to fight a lot more virus. And that's what's happening when we get a cold or an infection and our immune system kind of catches up. That's what's happening in that process. Okay. Um, you've heard of immune suppressants. There are chemicals that we give to suppress an overactive immune system. These are given for a couple of purposes. One of the purposes uh, uh, being that of an overactive immune system. In other cases, we give them to suppress immune responses for things like transplants. Cyclosporin uh, A is a uh, compound that is given to suppress uh, the immune response and uh, is very functional in doing so. All right, now, the last thing I'll mention is that once, let's say I've got a, uh, a cell that has an uh, immune, um, uh, it is bound to an antigen, it has recognized that I've got this antigen. And this was, let's say, an IgG that uh, recognized and bound to this. All right? I would like to be able to use that knowledge of that binding of that IgG variable region and put that onto other classes of antibodies. For example, some that might appear in my tears or some that might be um, protecting other things. Well, that can happen if the uh, immune cell goes through what's called class switching. The same sort of thing you're thinking you wish you had done two terms ago. Here. I went for the whole term to get to that joke. Do you realize that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're thanking me for waiting until the very end to tell it. I'm thinking too. <laughs> but class switching, that's actually what this is called. It is called class switching. Class switching involves basically replanting a specific variable region onto a different class constant region so that that can also give additional protection. Okay. Now, um, as I said, I will expect you anything I haven't uh, gone through here to read through for the final, and you'll see that on the final. Okay. That class switching looked a lot like a viral resistance cassette. Is there a similarity? A viral resistance cassette meaning? Uh, like antibiotic resistance cassettes where it loops out a section. No, no, no. People are still smiling. I don't know. So I promised you some surprises today. And so I think it's perhaps time that I bring up the surprises. All right? So the first surprise is that you are going to be responsible. No, OK, all right. It's not April Fool's. All right. And, uh, in fact, what I will do is um, I will stop what you're responsible for with the senses. You're not responsible for the immune system that I talked about today. So I saved the joke and I got the laughter, okay? And I, now I know how to get applause and it's the last day of class. I, I waited too long to get all these things. You guys should have said something sooner. Okay, well, um, as is traditional in the class, you guys were in class last term, you know that on the last day of class, I like to have a little surprise. And I've got some new things to do and some excitement with that. So um, we're done with the term. If you want to stay, stick around and hear and sing and join in on the fun, we're going to do some fun. So um, last term, at the end of the term, you may recall that 
you heard the biocomical choir. You heard them right here, okay? And I have to tell you, I know the anticipation is just, you're giddy with anticipation that, is it going to happen again? Well, you heard them. Now you get to experience the only campus group, okay? The only campus group that practices hydrogen bondage, okay? <laughs> that's what we're into, folks. I'm sorry, but that's, we're a DNA-based group, so we, we practice hydrogen bondage. That's a joke, okay. <clears throat> With that said, let me introduce the hydrogen bonds. Are we only two? Come, come on. Come on down. Come on. Everybody can come join. You guys in the back can come join. All right. So, so I have joining us. I have Emily. I have Aresta. I have Linda. I have Lisa. And I hope these guys sing louder than I do. Okay. So we have some songs for you. We actually have four songs. This is a, a record of some sort. And I'm going to need the words myself. So um, I hope that you will join us in singing loudly. And what's the rule on singing? Extra credit, okay. So if I hear you well enough, we will have a nice extra credit question on the exam. All right, everybody ready? The first tune. All right, I got to set this up a little bit. First tune. What was with that weather yesterday? Right? Everybody love that weather? I mean, we've had snow, we've had rain, we got a term, we got a day of the term called off. Are you tired of that? You're supposed to say yes. Okay. Well, we have a song to deal with that. It's to the tune of Let It Snow, and it goes, make it stop. Okay. <laughs> so the forecast says much more raining. It's of this that I'm complaining. I get cranky from all the slop. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. It is dark and it's gray and gloomy. The climate's out to screw me. I go crazy with drip, drop, drop. Please make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Every time that I look outside and I spot the sun, then I know that our weather is jackal high. When it goes out and makes a rainbow, now I know that the rain is dropping, that my clothing will be sopping. I don't care if it's good for crops. Just make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Okay, thank you. That's very good. Okay. We have two new songs today that are, they've actually been on my website, but we've never sung them in class. This is a world premiere of these songs. And the first of those is next. It's to the tune of Good King Wenceslas. And that's, the, that's a Christmas song. The Sprite song, right? Okay. And it's called Good Protein Synthesis. Amino acids cannot join by themselves together. They require ribosomes to create the tether. All the protein chains get made according to instruction, carried by mRNA and peptide bond construction. Small subunit starts it all with initiation, pairing out to RNAs at the docking station. Shine Delgarno's complement in the 16 S's. Lines the AUG up so synthesis commences. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Elongation happens in ribosomic insights, where our RNA creates bonds for polypeptides. These depart the ribosome, passing right straight through it. In the tiny channels there of the large subunit. Finally, when sequence of one of these stop codons parks itself in the A site, synthesis can't go on. P side RNA lets go of what it was holding, so the polypeptide can get on with its folding. All right. 
<clears throat> okay. The next one is another new song, and this is a tune everybody knows, and it's one of the hardest songs to sing. It's our national anthem. So you might put your ha hands on your heart again. This is a different song than we had before. This is, t this, is, this is the Star Spangled Banner. It's about sight, okay? Did you know you can see in the dimmest of light with your rods and your cones and the retinaldehyde found in rhodopsin it's got a bond shaped as this but it changes its state when a photon gets it straight then the signaling kicks in thanks to a transducin cause it's G GTP ways turn on diesterase. So gated ion channels stop charges from passing through, such as sodium plus one and calcium plus two. Excellent. Okay, that was good. I like that. That's good. Now, before I get to the last song, I, I realized that there was one announcement I didn't make that you all want to hear. I do have a review session scheduled. That is Sunday evening, 7.30 p.m., ALS 4001. I will videotape that and make it available as before. Okay? Sunday, ALS 4001. Examine here. Wednesday at noon, and um, you know how to sit and everything. Okay, now, for the last song, I need some help. And the help I need is from you. I need... Not too fast, not too fast. Ready? There's a bundle of things a student ought to know, and Ahern's talk isn't really very slow. Learning ain't easy, the lectures kind of blow. Thank God there's a video. Well, we've gone through the cycles and their enzymes too. Studying the regulation, everything is new. I gotta admit that I haven't got a clue. What am I gonna do? So I got me a note and got me a stride. I got the enzymes down and the names he requires. Hope I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's a video. Just got to speed about the NAD. Protons move into complex B. Electrons dance in the cytochrome C. Got to hear the EMP3. Fatty acid oxidation makes the acid away. <laughs> I made it make sure the mitochondria. Very complicated, I guess I got to say. Thank God there's a video. So I got me a note card, bought me a stryer, got the enzymes down and the names he requires. Hope I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's a video. Replication kind of easy in a simple kind of way. Copy in the bases in the plasma DNA. G's go with C's and T's go with A's. Thanks to polymerase. And the DNA is a template for the RNA. He was C's writing at TATA. Termination happens in the end that goes away. Don't forget the poly A. So I got me a note card, bought me a stryer, got the enzymes down and the names he requires. Think I can muster up a little more desire. Thank God there's a video. Extra credit. Extra credit. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys, that was awesome.